Hello, Leonard. Hey, Rob. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Know how busy you are. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you. And to start, um, you know, first of all, just to kick things off, just tell me a little bit about your your personal journey and uh, and really what inspired you to get into medicine. Sure. Um, right now, I'm a second year medical student at the University of Texas Medical Branch. I started thinking about medicine I think kind of from a, a young age. My dad's a, a urologist, and in kindergarten, I actually took a kidney stone the size of my fist in for a show and tell. All right, so medicine's always been kind of around and prevalent in my life, but I didn't start seriously considering it as a career um, up until high school. I think my freshman year, um, I went to a summer camp. I volunteered there, and it was a camp for children with special needs, hmm. and that had a big impact on me. Um, and I continue to go back every summer to volunteer with the kids and spend time with them. And so that had me or that kind of motivated me to apply for a combined medical program, uh, combined undergraduate and medical school program. So I was applying to medical school kind of as a high school senior. You do it as uh, college applications. And so I interviewed with uh, UTMB and with McGovern, um, got into the program. It's a seven year type program. So I went to undergrad at the University of Houston, finished that in about two and a half, three years, and now I'm here at UTMB. That's that's great. That's awesome. I, I understand you have a it's a pretty incredible story about your your grandparents uh, coming over and 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 setting up shop, you know, in in Galveston. Can you tell us a little bit about that and and any anything else about really just your own your own journey uh, growing up and how you how you enjoyed growing up in uh, in Galveston, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, my grandparents, uh, my mom's side, they immigrated um, over from Taiwan. And to get their citizenship, they ended up opening a, a motel in, in Galveston. And so it's kind of funny, um, like 30, 40 years later, I came back to where they opened up their motel to get their citizenship. And I'm here for medical school. Um, you know, they were in Galveston recently this past summer um, for an award ceremony of mine. And it, it was really meaningful because it kind of came full circle. You know, it, it wasn't easy opening up that motel um, to get their sure. citizenship. My mom's a graduate of Ball High School in Galveston, and I'm doing a, a community project there right now. Wow. Uh, so it, it kind of just has extra meaning for me to be here in Galveston. I feel very fortunate. That's yeah. fantastic. That's 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 amazing. That's great. And and what about any were there any teachers or mentors that had a big impact on you growing up, uh, whether medicine related or science related or not? Yeah, too many to count. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I progress in my education, you know, I'm, I'm extremely indebted to all of my my teachers. Um, particularly when I think back to my undergraduate education at the University of Houston, that's where I really started getting more into the medical humanities. I had a little bit of a background in high school through the International Baccalaureate Program, always very interested in history. Um, I had applied to be an anthropology major in college, and I was going to be for the longest time until I got into the combined program. Then at the University of Houston, we had a minor called Medicine and Society. And I took a lot of medical humanities classes there, uh, in particular, Dr. Helen Vallier. She has a, a PhD in medical history, and she was a huge mentor of mine in terms of learning about humanism in the arts, humanism in medicine. Uh, and then another mentor of mine was Dr. Hannah Decker. That was probably one of my favorite classes in all of undergrad. It was called The History of Madness. We looked at uh, mental illness in the West after the Enlightenment and society's reactions to uh, people with mental illness and how it has changed over time. And, and that really had me start to think about um, where we can look into the human condition in ways other than just strict science. And when did you uh, when did you first become aware or hear the words and the name William Mosler? The first time, I think, was actually scrolling through my pediatrician's uh, website <laughs> or his his biography, uh, Austin Regional Clinic, right? And he had a quote from Sir William Osler. And I didn't think much of it at the time. I was probably 16, 17 years old. That was the very first time that I heard about Sir William Osler. I read a little bit of his works in 
in undergrad, but really not too much until I came to UTMB. And, and once you're at UTMB, you get plenty of emails. You see Sir William Osler everywhere. Um, you see the John P. McGovern Academy. And that's how I really uh, got started with uh, Osler and all of the history. You wear a lot of hats. You do a lot, you know, in terms of w- with school, but you're also write articles, you're presenting and so forth. And I think you, I think you did an article about your first year of medical school. Is that, is that correct? Uh, talking about your high school versus medical school? What, what, That's right. Tell me That's a little right. bit about that. Sure, sure. So the article, it was an op-ed. Uh, I talked about how I thought my high school experience was harder than my first year of medical school. Um, and I think that speaks to, to th- two things. I think the first one is how much support we get from UTMB and, and how generous the curriculum is. Uh, We're able to build our own schedules. You have plenty of mentorship support from faculty and from older students. And I think the second thing it speaks to is my high school was very, very tough. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I went to high school in uh, in Austin, uh, Austin, Texas. Um, I did the International Baccalaureate program. I was on the the tennis team. We practiced every single day. Uh, Our off season was only two weeks. And so there just wasn't enough time to do everything, I think. Um, School was was really hard. Uh, Definitely a a huge learning curve stepping up into high school. I think more so than the transition from undergrad to UTMB. Wow, that's great. That's that's amazing. You mentioned when you first heard about about Osler, why do you think uh, why do you think it's important for medical students and young physicians to to know about Osler and his history? I think if you had asked me that question a year ago, I probably would have had a different answer. Uh, I, I think just because the the nature of medical school of medical training can be really tough. You know, uh, like even right now, I'm, I'm studying for tests and we have finals coming up. You can get so engrossed in the nitty gritty details of the science and the pathophysiology that you kind of start to lose the human centered focus. And I think that's where studying someone like Sir William Osler and what he represents, I think that's where it's really important to really stay centered to what medicine is all about. And that's healing, that's human connection. Uh, that's being compassionate, being empathetic. It's it's so important, but I also know that medical students, it's always a challenge with time, right? We, you know, everybody's so busy and there's so much going on and young physicians. How do you juggle it all and, and try and keep that at toward the forefront of, w- of what you're doing in, in all your other activities and with school and everything else? Good question. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think you have to really sit back and think about your priorities and your long-term goals. Uh, I know that in four or five years, the how I did on a test um, in a couple of weeks really won't matter too much um, versus the type of person that I'm trying to become, the type of physician that I want to be for my patients, uh, the type of brother or son that I want to be for my family. I think really focusing on the things that are going to be important to you long term is how you uh, prioritize what you're going to do with your time. Absolutely. What do you think now that you've gotten to know much more about Oster, what, what would you say is his biggest contribution or one of his biggest contribution? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is tough. I've, I've only really truly, I guess, known Osler for a year and a half or so. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot from the American Osler Society. I think to me with, with my limited knowledge so far, I, I think his contribution has been making sure that we're keeping the patient at the center of our education and of our practice. Yeah. Uh, sound scientific methods, all very, very important, but being able to maintain a human connection, um, something that you really can't teach in textbooks. And so his bedside teaching, I, I think that's been his biggest contribution. As you know, you know, Osler also talks a lot about equanimity and the importance of of having that, you know, again, as a physician and juggling different things, but keeping the important things at the forefront. Um, why do you think equanimity is is so important in the medical field? I think it's important, not just in the medical field, but but all fields. Uh, you have to have that balance and, and that sense of being able to stay cool under pressure. Uh, I, I think that when you have so many different things tugging at you all at once, you have to be able to focus your energy and be present. 
when you're engaging with a patient, when you're engaging with, with anyone else, uh, and really maintain that, that type of human connection and not become distant to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm assuming you, you first heard about the American Oster Society while, uh, while at school in Galveston. Is that, is that correct? That's right. And, and how did you, how did you become more involved? And, and you, you recently presented in Galveston. Great job, by the way. Thank um, you. How did that all come about with you just kind of getting to know more about not only Osler, but the society? It's it's funny. I, I got really, really lucky. <laughs> uh, I had seen the, the emails that UTMV and Dr. Malloy, Dr. Michael Malloy sends out about the American Osler Society. And at the time I thought, oh, you know what, this is a, a cool uh, a cool thing. I think I'd be interested, but I was like, I don't think I have time for this. And I'm not sure if I'm like actually qualified to to present at the AOS, right? Uh, and then I met Corbin Corvero. He was a fourth year medical student at the time, and he kind of took me under his wing, um, told me about how he had presented before and how great it was. And I was like, okay, maybe I could do this. And he helped me out. You know, he he sent me his abstracts and showed me uh, previous presentations that it had been, been done. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can do this, especially if other medical students are doing it. Uh, so I got very lucky to, to meet Dr. Malloy and to meet Corbin Corvero. That's great. As I said, you, you did a fantastic job. How was the, uh, talk about the experience from your point of view, attending, uh, I'm assuming your first, your first meeting and, and meeting everybody and then also presenting. Yeah, uh, it was, it was really nice. And again, I think I'm really lucky because it was in Galveston that year. I know this upcoming year it's in London. That would have been, I think, way more intimidating since it wasn't not in my home turf. Uh, it was really nice. That was my first conference that I had ever been to. Uh, I was very surprised that there were so many other people that shared similar interests to me. We saw presentations of all types. And I think every single one was engaging. Uh, I would love to learn all of that way more than anything else that we're learning for, for physiology right now. Uh, <laughs> I was extremely fortunate to have the resources at UTMB and our uh, blocker history collection. I worked with Dr. Paula Summerlee to help me with the presentation. Uh, she is a bubonic plague expert. Uh, and so I, I'm deeply grateful to, to her help for, for the presentation. When I was reading a little bit about you and, I, and also just talking to some of the others, tell me about the young Oslerans and, and what's that all about? How did that come to be and, and how did you become involved? Yeah. Uh, again, it was emails, right? <laughs> um, Dr. Stanley um, had sent out some, some emails about the, the young Oslerians uh, and he had put out a call for social messaging editors for the AOS. And I looked into it. Uh, I enjoy writing. And he was talking about, oh, perhaps we can write op-eds. It was just uh, trying to engage more of the medical student, undergraduate student, um, resident trainees, that type of population into the, um, trying to engage them with the American Oster Society. So I reached out to him. I told him, hey, I, I love to write. Um, I'm very interested in, in these topics. Um, I'd love to see what we can do. And so then I, I met up with him and a few other uh, medical students at the time, and we were able to start an Instagram for the AOS, uh, which I think was pretty successful with connecting to, to younger people. Honestly, we, we check our emails and then sometimes they, they just go left un unread. Um, but Instagram, Twitter, the other types of social media, I, I think it's, uh, it's very engaging for people my age. Absolutely. No, and, and you've all been doing such a great job with that. And, uh, keep them coming, you know, that we, we need more ideas along those lines. And, uh, you know, as you know, so many people are always on their phones and, and uh, any, any way we can expand the reach and, and just let people know what a great organization it is. And hopefully they can have experiences like you did uh, coming to the meeting, presenting and, and hopefully uh, joining the, the ranks. You know, that, that Meeting in Galveston was the first time that we were all able to be together since the pandemic, you know, since the global pandemic. And your what you spoke on was, you know, very timely, you know, in the sense of, uh, of uh, you know, having to deal with something like that. Talk a little bit about uh, your own experience, you know, uh, during COVID. Well, it was definitely way different. Um, I remember when we first found out the pandemic was going to be a, a really big deal. I was coming back from a road trip and my school had been canceled. 
I was like, oh, another week of vacation, right? But then it continued to get canceled and canceled and pushed back until right. finally we were fully online. Uh, and at that point, I moved back from Houston, uh, where I was in college, back home to Austin uh, to stay at my, my childhood home. And it wasn't easy, you know, trying to go to class with a, a full house. My grandparents, we decided to have them move back in with us. Uh, that summer, I was also studying for the MCAT. And uh, wow. I had planned originally, you know, to always go to the gym, be able to hang out with friends to, to decompress. And so I kind of had to adapt and, and change that. It completely changed my my whole routine there. But I, I think it, it taught me to be able to think on my feet and be able to adapt when things don't go as planned. And that's been incredibly helpful um, as I've continued along with school and, and with life in general. Absolutely. What do you think are, are some of the biggest challenges? Uh, you've touched upon some of them, but for you know young medical students and young physicians uh, that they face today, I think I can definitely speak to to young medical students and, and the biggest challenges that we face. Uh, it's I think information overload. We have access to so much information, so many different resources, and it's hard to prioritize what to focus on. I think that's the same thing as uh, opportunities. We have access, uh, at least from my experience, you know, you can be involved with so many different things, but you just simply won't have the time for that. I I think it goes back to really centering yourself and trying to think about your priorities and your long-term goals in order to make the right decision for yourself. Are are there any things that come to mind that that you would change or improve if you could in terms of the um, the way medical school is and what improvements or, or what you'd like to see improve in the future to just make it a better all around experience? Great question. I think medical education is extremely important. What I would want to change about it is to incorporate more humanities in there. I, I think that's extremely, extremely important. Uh, I think learning about topics like burnout, moral injury, compassion, fatigue, the limits of empathy. I think that's extremely important to know before you enter practice. And I was very lucky to have learned some of those uh, topics in my undergraduate education because I sought them out. But in medical school, our exposure to the medical humanities, to humanism and medicine, it's extremely limited. And it's even more so limited to mostly the people that seek out those opportunities. But I think that it's something that every single medical student should be exposed to. Definitely. Um, particularly like, like you were saying with, with like empathy fatigue and, and just overload, um, what have been the, the ways that, that you've managed to, um, cope with, with that and, and, and also just a, just an incredibly difficult and, and busy schedule. Um, it's amazing and a testament to who you are as a person that you're involved in so many different areas and you're able to, uh, you know, to, to manage it all. Um, but are there any, any things that, that you found, whether you've discovered them yourself or, or gotten from other mentors or other people that have just, just helped you personally? Absolutely. I think when it comes to empathy and, and compassion fatigue, you might have a, a very difficult day in, in the clinic um, or a diff- difficult day studying. Uh, I write a lot. I, I reflect and I process a lot through my writing. And that seems to be very helpful for me. I also really love going to the gym. (laughs) Uh, I don't know if that's uh, very useful for this interview, but the the gym really helps me decompress. Uh, And it's it's something that I consistently do. And so I would encourage everyone to, whether it's cooking or going to the gym or hanging out with friends, to keep doing what you enjoy in your life and, and don't give those things up. It's all about balance. Yeah, yeah, you you definitely need an outlet. Absolutely. With you coming to the meeting and just meeting some of the people that you have and like Dr. Malloy, as you, you mentioned, um, what do you think is the uh, the greatest value in, in attending like a, a live meeting and, and now in a post-COVID world, sometimes hybrid, you know, even through Zoom and so forth, but just having those, those interactions with, um, you know, people that you know, the members of the Oster Society are very varied, but they're all incredibly, in- incredible people that have done extraordinary things to experience and get to know some of them. How, how has that affected you? And why would you encourage others to try and, and get involved and hopefully become a member and, and attend meetings? I think it's inspiring. As a medical student who feels 
very busy, who feels pulled in all different directions. It's very encouraging to see highly successful professionals still able to keep the humanities, to keep the study of uh, Osler and his values at the core uh, of their um, of their life, of, of their profession. I think also attending the American Osler Society allowed me to create a lot of professional connections to talk to people about, oh, how did they get started with the AOS? Um, how did they get started with the humanities or how did they choose their specialty? Uh, I think having just these one-on-one -on -one conversations and meeting everyone uh, was extremely helpful to see different perspectives. Another thing in my in my research, um, I discovered that you uh, you you received a John P. McGovern Award, so congratulations! Thank you. And uh, and, and and tell us what that what that was all about. Sure, um, I got one of the Osler Student Scholar Awards. Uh, they're given out typically to I think two or four uh, medical students per year, um, and. It, it provides some financial support for my education, as well as access to the vast resources of uh, the academy. And so I've gotten to meet a lot of outstanding faculty, uh, Osler faculty scholars uh, within the academy, and got to learn more about the history of John McGovern and, and William Osler. And I think it's important to me just to be a part of an organization uh, that is trying to promote the values of Dr. McGovern and, and William Osler. I, I think that's uh, been very beneficial in terms of creating professional connections. And again, just keeping myself centered to what I find important and the type of physician that I want to be. Congratulations. And uh, did you already know the others that were, were awarded that honor as well? Yeah, it's a very close knit group. Uh, okay. We have like monthly, bi-monthly meetings. I see them all the time. Uh, right. We work on certain projects together. Uh, right now, we're working to distribute the applications for the first years right now and just trying to spread the word of, of the McGovern Academy. Uh, it's, it's extremely close knit here. I guess for you, just in, in what you've uh, experienced so far, learning about Osler, learning about the, the AOS and the, and the society, um, what's been the most rewarding part of of your journey so far um, in the Oster Society? I think the, the most rewarding part in the Oster Society and learning about Osler has just been meeting everyone that's in it. Uh, I think creating those connections. Now, I, I know neurologists over at Mayo Clinic that I can email anytime if I have questions. Uh, and you meet so many different people. I stay in touch with some medical students from McGill. Um, that I never would have had the opportunity to interact with if I hadn't gone to the AOS meeting. And, and now we're collaborating on a few projects. I talk to them a good amount. Um, I hear about their experience in medical school in Canada, which is pretty different from, from ours in the U.S. Uh, and, and that's just extremely, I, I think, rewarding to me to hear those perspectives from other people. Okay. And, and Leonard, talk a little bit about the importance of, of mentorship. Yeah, I think, like I said before, I feel like I got extremely lucky uh, with the, the medical humanities in medical school. I was fortunate enough to, to meet these fantastic mentors that really carved the way for me to, to get involved with these types of things. I think it's important for other students uh, or trainees to seek out mentorship and to seek out these opportunities and, and to kind of cast a, a wide net because you never know who you'll meet and who will have a, a huge influence on your life. Great, great. You know, you were talking about the different social media um, outlets that are available uh, about to learn about Osler, to learn about the, uh, the society. Um, where can people find you and, and where would you point them if they wanted to get more information about Osler? Our Twitter for the American Osler Society is at American Osler. And for Instagram, it's American Osler Society. You're really an inspiration as far as all you're doing. And um, we're really thrilled and lucky to have you involved with the Osler Society. So keep up the good work and thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.